We are blessed and privileged to have Michael Boris here with us today. Uh, my wife and I and a few friends of Michael's had the privilege of, of, of breaking some bread with him this afternoon. He was picked up at Newark Airport uh, uh, by John and Marianne Pinnell. I don't know how many of you folks know John and Marianne, but they're good luck. And I'll tell you what struck me as we, as my, as my beautiful wife, as the bride of my youth and I sat down and we came late. Uh, Michael and, and, and his and his associate Charlie, they came, from, they were picked up. They came in from Romania, but they beat us. They beat us to the place we were supposed to meet him at. And I looked at Michael and I said, "My goodness, man, you look like you've just been on a two-week vacation or something like that." They flown all the way from Romania, connected down in Atlanta, I guess, or somewhere else. But uh, he's here tonight, uh, fresh off, uh, fresh off the Jet Airways, uh, to speak with us. Michael Morris is president and founder of St. Michael's Media. He's among the generations of Catholics who simply didn't receive thorough and accurate catechesis. Through his Catholic television show, The One True Faith, and his collaboration with Church Militant TV, that's www.churchmilitanttv, Michael intends to change that. Michael graduated from Notre Dame in 1983 with a degree in communications and concentrated studies in history and politics. He not only trained as a young man in theology at the doctrinally sound St. Joseph's Seminary in Yonkers, but in April of 2009, he received his Sacred Theology Baccalaureate, commonly known as STB, from Angelicum in Rome, and he graduated magna cum laude. He spent a number of years working as a CBS affiliate anchor, producer and reporter in various markets, winning multiple Emmys for his work in broadcast news. Working in the secular media provided him with not only the technical knowledge to produce excellent television programming, but a profound grasp of the need to, pro to pro produce programs that leave the viewer improved spiritually rather than merely entertain. How's that for a fresh idea in our culture today? On May 8, 2006, Michael opened St. Michael's Media, a new state-of-the-art digital television studio located in Ferndale, Michigan, just a little uh, north of Detroit, as Michael uh, let us know. It's the production center of broadcast quality Catholic programs designed to educate a generation of Catholics largely ignorant of church teachings and I think we agreed most importantly to save souls from eternal damnation. How many have seen some of Michael's programs on television? Yeah, a lot of good, good, good part of the people, Michael. On September 1st, 2008, he partnered with www.realcatholictv.com, the first ever online Catholic television station. Realizing that the internet is where it's at, Michael and St. Michael's Media began producing daily Catholic programming for viewers and subscribers of realcatholictv.com, Catholic News Roundup, The Shadow Priest, and the ever popular The Vortex. Mm -hmm. Michael is the creator and host which has been, uh, of this program, The Vortex, which has been seen by millions of viewers. And uh, probably many of you know that, that uh, now www.churchmilitantv is the new name for realcatholictv.com. Is that correct? With a passion for saving souls, Michael epitomizes that what it means to be a member of the Catholic laity today, to live out each day, and defining what is meant by the new evangelization, utilizing the tools of the 21st century. Without further delay, would you please give a warm welcome, fresh from Romania, to Rockland County, New York, Michael Bortz. to uh, tell you the flight from Romania, uh, we were over there uh, as part of a month-long trip in Europe, and uh, we were in Italy for three weeks and then Romania for the last week, and we were in Romania specifically for a Catholic Youth Conference, National Catholic Youth Conference, so we spent a few days in uh, Bucharest, Bucharest as I was corrected 40 million times, uh, but the natives, and then uh, we went on to a small little town uh, called uh, 
Yachts, which was where the conference was. And uh, it was very nice. However, it was further away from the United States. So when our journey home began, <laughs> we had, uh, uh, we left the conference, immediately went to a hotel, got about two and a half hours of sleep, uh, or flew to Bucharest, went to a hotel, got two and a half hours of sleep, got up at, after, I don't know, three in the morning or something, flew to Rome, raced through the airport in Rome just in time to make it on the flight back. God was good, though, because he gave us, we got an upgrade to business class yeah. flying back across the Atlantic, so thank you. Uh, and we flew to Atlanta, got delayed there in a couple of hours, came into Newark, and here we are. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite remarkable, actually. So I would like to uh, apologize if, uh, if the uh, suit looks all wrinkled and messy and, and your hair cut and all that stuff. It's, uh, it's traveling for a month, you start to run out of everything. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, thank you for your forbearance if things look a little sloppy. Um, I'd like to begin, as, uh, as always do with every talk, with a prayer and ask you to join. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to begin uh, tonight with a very quick biblical reference, and then ask you if you can just sort of hold that in a part of your mind uh, so, so we can reference back to it. Recall that about an hour or so before the Roman governor Pontius Pilate uh, handed Jesus over uh, to be crucified, he got into something of a philosophical a very brief philosophical discussion with Jesus. You could call it a discussion. He looked at him and he said, truth, what is truth? And went about his business. Keep that, because that's important. What is truth? And Jesus, of course, didn't give him an answer, because he is truth. But when we take a look at what's going on in the United States in particular today, and Western Europe in general. The lands that used to be known as Christendom, and I say used to be known because they are no longer Christendom. And I think one of the very difficult realities for people is to take a look at what is going on around us and realize sort of down in our guts, in our core, that we are, what we knew no longer exists. It's over. Uh, very wonderful Archbishop, uh, now the uh, venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen, of whom I am a great devotee, said in the uh, uh, late 1960s and early 1970s that Christendom is dead. That was 45 years ago. Christendom is dead. Christianity is not dead, but Christendom is dead. And he's defined what is Christendom. Christendom is the sort of combination of social, legal, moral, political, all that activity that happens in a culture, uh, in the case of Christendom, that is centered around Christ. That's over. That civilization is gone. And until we, particularly here in America, since we're talking about Americans, when, until we Americans realize that that's the reality, we will spin our wheels and just be frustrated. Christendom is gone. Now, I'd like to quote to you something. I have three little quotes here that I pulled out from what Bishop Sheen said. There is a interesting fact that 50 years ago, Nobody, the, the, the people of the country, never really cared about politics that much. You know, you sort of go back to the 19, early 1960s or earlier 1950s, there really weren't mass riots in the street and political, it just wasn't a thing. The whole, the whole political system of the United States was something of a mystery to the average person. Why? 
Jewish people didn't really have a particular interest in politics because they didn't really see how it affected their lives. Because in reality, with the exception of preserving something that had already been established, it really didn't. Do you know what the US federal income tax rate was in 1956? Two percent. Why do I care if I vote for him or vote for him or vote for him? It's two, it doesn't affect me at all, really. But then came the 1960s, what some people like to call the evil 60s. It's a good name for them. And the underpinning of the culture began to fall apart, little by little. We'll get into that. And what happened as morality started to break down is that politics started to become more important. Archbishop Sheen, if I may quote him, simple sentence. It was through a loss of belief in the moral law that politics became so important. That man was brilliant. It was through a loss of belief in the moral law that politics became so important. Why? Because when the morality went away, slowly at first, but then picked up momentum as time went on, so that we live in a situation today where 4,000 Americans are killed, you know, hundreds of thousands, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of young men have no fathers, the culture's falling apart, anybody over 60 looks around America and says, this is not the country I grew up in. My father lives with me, he's going to be 83 in October, and uh, he's a perfectly sound mind, he's deaf as a doornail, but that's it. Everything else is uh, the mortar, the bricks of my house rattles and shakes out when he turns on TV, but yeah. aside from that, everything's fine. He sits and watches the news, he sits and watches Fox News, and he just sits there and says, this is not the America I grew up in. And he's right. It's not even America I grew up in. Mm -hmm. When the moral foundations of a society give way, something else has to be put in their place to sort of uphold and keep the engine going. And when morality fell apart, started to fall apart in the 1960s, along came politics to step in. So when we're fighting these political battles right now, what are we really fighting? We're really fighting a war of morals, of morality. Because the morality has been, has been eschewed, it's gone. The culture has rejected the morality. So those who still cling to the morality want to somehow reintroduce it into the culture. Well, you can't do that with just the common man or the common woman because they reject it. So what do you do? Well, you turn to politics. And so we try to get laws based on morality. And what does the side and the adherence of the anti-morality crowd say? Don't try to impose your morality on me. Keep your laws to yourself. Keep your rosaries off my ovaries. You know all the slogans. You've seen them all. They're on every sign. So morality, when it falls apart, has to be replaced. This is replaced with politics. Go back and think about what Benjamin Franklin said when they walked out of that hall. And she said, what have you given us? The lady comes up to me and says, we've given you a republic, madam, if you can hang on to it. If that was not the song, sort of the prelude to the American experiment Nothing summed it up greater than that phrase. So what do we need to keep the American experiment going, thriving, living? You need a moral people. If you do not have a moral people, your civilization falls apart. Historians look back over human history and identify 20 civilizations, and us being the 21st, Western civilization being the 21st. 
and every single one of them came to an end exactly the same way. And why should that be surprising? Human beings are, after all, essentially carbon copies of each other. We're not different species. Does something really separate us from the ancient Romans other than technology and time? Were they not slaves to their passions? Did they not want individuals, were they not ruled by individuals who sought not the common good, but personal advancement? Every culture is built like this because every culture is comprised of human beings, fallen, sinful human beings. And when you talk about politics and government, at some point, when government becomes so powerful, when the scales have tipped, it's hard to pick those particular points out, but we know we've passed it. All of a sudden, government assumes and acts as though it is the giver of rights, as though rights come from the government, which is antithetical to anything, anything related to Jesus Christ, anything related to the Jewish faith. The government does not give rights. The government does not grant rights. The government protects rights. And if it does not protect the right, it becomes an evil dictatorship. The instant government gets in its mind that it is the grantor of rights is the day tyranny begins. Sometimes it takes a while, depending on what the circumstances are, depending on what civilization you are, how much technology do you have, what's the opposition you face. But after a while, sooner or later, the wheels, the machinery of the government take over. And that's exactly what we're seeing today. So this is the American experiment. 250-ish years later, here we are. This is the American experiment. And something that's very sad to have to face up to is the fact that as we look at this, the American experiment has failed. If we look at it in the sense that we want it to be this way, meaning good people, moral people want the outcome to be a certain way, then the experiment has failed. There's absolutely not a reason on earth to think that at the current rate, the United States of America will be around in 100 years, even 50 years. Certainly not the manner it is now. There's nothing to think that in 10 years I would be allowed to stand in front of a, a crowd here with a microphone and even say these kinds of things. So, or anybody for that fact, not just me. But I'd like to propose to you that there is something inherent in the great American experiment that sort of the seeds for our own doom were always present in germ form. Pilate looks at our blessed Lord and says, as the state, what is truth? What is truth? What a wonderful, what a wonderful little encapsulation of everything that we face as a nation and a civilization and a culture right now, and a wonderful encapsulation is right there. The state looking at God, saying what is truth? In a defiant fashion. Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you? I can bring you to an end religion. That's what the state says to God, to religion. 
How has America arrived at the point America is at now? Think about this. 4,000 of our fellow citizens are killed every day. Parades happen in major cities, particularly in the month of June, but in various other times also, where perverted notions of sexual morality are displayed on floats. But those are just the great big newsreel type things. The insidiousness of what happens every day in the nation's public school classrooms, that in this diabolical Obamacare, and it is diabolical, because it provides for evil. Mm -hmm. To put a Planned Parenthood clinic in virtually every school in the United States. To teach a form of so-called sex education that perverts the very understanding of gender. Not just relationships, but gender. Right from the pits of hell. How did America get to this point? Because Americans, in our founding documents, there was a snake curled up under the table. And it has been sitting there, waiting to strike for over two centuries. And it found its ability to strike in the middle of the 20th century the beginning to the middle of the 20th century. And it is the notion of truth. How can a people exist as a people when they disagree over what is truth? A house divided against itself cannot stand. How can we possibly think? How can we possibly think? We had a civil war about this 150 years ago. In Abraham Lincoln's famous House Divided speech, he hit this same thing. But there it was kind of easy. It was easier to see the sides. It was sort of one issue. You know, if you go down to the South today, you know, they still call it the War of Northern Aggression. But, I mean, you saw there, you know, there was one issue and two sort of spins on it. North versus South, slavery, not slavery. But today, today, it's not that clear because there's so many issues. There are so many things that we simply can't get our hands around, can't get our minds wrapped around all these. All these things seem to compete with each other. It's interesting, a number of polls that I've seen, and we stick our head in polls a lot because of the work we do at our website and news and current events and all of that. It's interesting to see the great celebration made over, look at all of these youth, so many of them that are pro-life. Good. They're opposed to abortion at every stage from the moment of conception. But buried in there, is a great support for same-sex marriage. What is truth? What is truth? We Americans have a built-in problem that you don't see in other countries. They have their own problems. But we have hailed diversity and pluralism and set these concepts up as gods and stand around and praise them. We are great because of our diversity. Well, that may be true if you're talking about which restaurant to go to dinner for, but that is not true when you're talking about arriving at truth. Truth is truth, and there cannot be two truths. There cannot be competing truths. So when Americans Look at our founding documents. What's in those documents? Ultimately, ultimately, what's there is that truth derives from the people. Think about this. 
Truth derives from the people. That's what's there. That's our entire electoral system is set up like that. The electoral college system is set up like that. Everything is set up like that. That is the will of the majority. The court system exists purely to make sure that the majority does not impose its tyrannical rule on the minorities, whatever the, whatever the case is you're talking about. Truth derives from the people. That is not Christian. Truth does not derive from the people. When we started as a nation and continued through most of the 17th century, uh, 18th century, and into the beginning, most of the 19th century, we all shared, all these different <laughs> groups, all shared the same common morality. That morality was a Catholic morality. So right up until most of our parents' generations, you would never dream of getting divorced and remarried. Absolutely not. If a girl got in trouble, mom and dad would send her off. She had to finish a degree, and then she came back. No, I'm not saying that's the right approach to it. I'm saying there was a shame attached to sex outside of marriage, and then obviously this is proof that that happened. There was a shame attached to divorce and remarriage. There was a shame attached to adultery, to living together. You'd never dream of shacking up. Do you know where the expression shacking up comes from? It comes from uh, the idea of playing house. But since you're not really united to each other, you don't have a house, you have a shack. That's where the expression comes from. There was a common morality that held the nation together. And as the Catholic immigrants came over from Italy and Germany and Ireland, sure, there were social differences, there were certainly theological differences with the Protestant majority that was here and still is. But the morality was there, and everybody, it didn't matter if you were an Italian Catholic or a New England Presbyterian, the thought of abortion was never even, it never entered your mind. The thought of running off and committing adultery and getting divorced and remarried never entered your mind. And there was an entire cultural support of that. Even in un unfortunate circumstances where things did go wrong or things didn't work out the way they should, if there was the case of a, you know, a, a fatherless child, well, the neighborhood helped look after him. You know, grandma would be out the window making sure he wasn't getting in trouble. The stories aren't that far off in memory of if you got in trouble at school, you would come home and get in trouble again. <laughs> Those are all within living memory, certainly my living memory. But then a funny thing happened. Cultural morality is rooted in something. It isn't just, it isn't just, oh, we all agree this is a good way to be, so let's be this way. The American political system is set up to allow whatever morality wants to rule the day to rule the day. That's there. Philosophically, in those documents, that is there. Perhaps Benjamin Franklin didn't quite realize what he was saying. Maybe he had great prophetic insight. We don't know. But contained in his answer to that woman is that truth. I've given you, we've given you a republic, madam, if you can hold on to it. Why wouldn't you be able to hold on to it? You wouldn't be able to hold on to it because a moral people, when they lose their morality, lose their republic. Why? Because they misuse their freedom. They misuse their freedom. The entire American experiment was centered on man, 
rights come from man, man can rule himself. Where did that notion come from in the middle of the 18th century? It came from the Enlightenment philosophers, largely of France, but also other places of Europe 200 years before. And it worked its way through. Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, all of them. And where did they get it from? They got it from the Protestant Reformation idea of overthrowing authority in the middle of the 16th century. And if you trace the events through history, that's what you wind up with. We're standing here essentially 250 years after the birth of the nation. If you go back to the birth of the nation and back up 250 more years, you're standing right smack in the middle of the Protestant Reformation in Europe. One event created another event, and here we are. How can anybody in a civilization which says the rights come from you, the people, when the majority of the people vote individuals into office who then enact immoral laws, which are unjust laws, how can anyone say, oh, that's wrong? Based on what? There is a philosophical problem in the very documents of the founding of America, and that it's, it is not a reference to God. It is a reference to man. Remember that most of the people who helped work out those documents were not these great, big, wonderful Christians the way we think of that. Many of them were deists, and their philosophical, theological needle was not sitting here pointing at Jesus Christ. It was pointing at the notion of a supreme being, nature's God, that set the universe in motion, gave man a few things, rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and then let him be. We all agreed on the same morality, for the most part. What we did not agree on was the source of that morality. And without a source, a touchstone that says, this is moral and this is immoral because of this, when you remove the this, now it becomes, that's your morality, that's my morality. And that's exactly where we are today. And there is no backpedaling from this position. You simply cannot, and the other side has told you this, do not impose your morals on me. There's no way to back away from that without saying there is a objective morality and you are in violation of it. If you do not hold that position, you will never be able to convince anybody. See, we all believed in an objective morality. Everybody did. The majority Protestants in the United States, the minority Catholics when they came to Ellis Island and different uh, embarkation points, they all believed the same thing with morals. Then in 1930, in England, the Anglican Church, State Church of England, had a conference, so they have every 10 years, called Lambeth. And at the Lambeth Conference in 1930, the Church of England, after having three times before, in 1907, 1910, and 1920, three times before, rejected the idea of contraception in marriage, finally accepted it. And they made the one brief, very brief allowance, very narrow allowance, that contraception could only, only be permissible morally between a husband and wife. That's all they needed to do. The instant the Church of England overrode divine law and substituted man-made law, when that idea came across the ocean, 
and got over here and got into the American bloodstream in the next generation, contraception took off. Today, you will be hard pressed to find any, any religion, any Protestant denomination that officially condemns contraception. One by one, every single one of them gave into it. And since this is a Protestant majority country, it became the norm. It became so much of the norm that groveling Catholics just dying to be accepted at the table, wanting a place at the table, accepted it too. Catholic hierarchy kept their mouths shut about the intrinsic evil of contraception. 30 years after Lambeth, there is candidate John Kennedy standing in front of a group of ministers in Houston saying, don't worry about my Catholicism, it doesn't mean anything to me, I am, so I'm here running for president of the United States, not running for president of the church. I will take my faith and lay it aside so as not to offend anybody. Because that's what you have to do in a civilization that says majority rules and there is no touchstone to morality. What is truth? A morality must be based in truth. Hard truth. Many of us remember from various people getting advice Never talk about religion or politics. We've all heard that a thousand times. Oh gosh, don't bring up religion and politics. You know what'll happen. All that news, so don't talk about religion and politics. Can you tell me anything else that's more important to be talking about? What is politics? Politics is the organized system of government, hopefully self-government, which incorporates in your religious and moral points of view, right? It's what it is. But you can't talk about these two things. This is how we govern ourselves. This is how we determine if that child in the womb should be cut to shreds and sucked out through a vacuum cleaner, and that should be called a right. If these two men over here, or these two women over here, should be allowed to take their uh, 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 desire to have sexual relations with each other, and it be crowned by the state and called marriage. This is precisely how we determine these things. Why is it wrong? Is it wrong? Many, many, many of those hundreds of thousands of young people that march through the streets of Washington, D.C. on the March for Life oppose abortion. They abhor it. Yet they support homosexual marriage, so-called marriage. Why? Why is that wrong? Can somebody explain to this 17-year-old why Bobby and Mark shouldn't be allowed to be married? And what are you going to base that on? Hey, don't impose your morality. If these guys want to get married, who are you to say that? If you look at the left's banners under which they stand, they use the same words. They use the same words from the enlightened philosophers of France. What are the Catholic bishops fighting about now? Religious liberty. What are the uh, homosexual activists, the militant homosexual activists fighting for? They're fighting for marriage equality. You see how ideas rule the day. If you rule and win the idea, you win everything. And so, people who believe that there is an objective morality rooted in a God simply went to sleep. And they never discussed amongst themselves, hey, which view of morality is right? We all sort of accepted that there's a morality. Most of America, 
For example, in the horrible Batman movie shootings, almost everybody in America thinks what that guy did was immoral and evil. But do most Americans think killing a child in the womb is immoral and evil? On an interesting note, over 60% of Americans say that abortion is murder according to their personal system of beliefs. They believe it's really stand freely and admit it to pollsters. 60%. Yes, it's murder. Murder. And less than 40% of them would outlaw murder in the case of abortion in every instance. One third of people who think that's murder think it's permissible murder. How do we talk about morality? They think they're moral. People who oppose abortion think totally, in all circumstances, think they're moral, think their position's moral, think it's rooted in morality. What is truth? What's your morality rooted in? What is morality rooted in? How do you get to the truth? Morality must be rooted in truth or it's immoral. So the question that needs to be had isn't, is this moral or this immoral, but the question is, what is truth and how do you get to it? How can you be assured that it's truth? Ah. Well, we know never to talk about politics. But the more important question there is talking about religions. There is no way on God's green earth it is not possible that all religions preach the truth because they preach contradictions. This is the discussion that was never had and has never been allowed to happen in the United States. It simply cannot be the case that all religions are equal and have equal access to truth. It's impossible. How can one religion claim contraception is fine and another religion say, no, it's not, it's sinful and it's evil, and both of them be right. Not possible. How can one religion say that two members of the same gender should be allowed to be married and adopt children and have all the tax benefits that accrue? And another religion say, no, that's immoral, and both religions be right. This is the heart, this is the reason the American experiment failed. Because truth was relegated to the individual. And all you had to do was get a majority, or 50% plus one, to say this is what was moral, and that was moral. And as long as that 50% plus one were voting and sensing and sort of interior gutting that, yeah, abortion's murder, adultery's wrong, divorce and remarriage is horrible, shacking up together is horrible. As long as they stayed on that side of the line, everything was fine. But there's nothing to anchor them to that side. Nothing, as we saw in 1960, the FDA approved the birth control pill, and the wheels came off the wagon, off the culture. Eight years later, Pope Paul VI issued his encyclical Humanae Vitae, predicting every single crisis that we are in right now, saying, if contraception becomes widespread, these things will happen. Men will lose respect for women and begin to objectify them. Families will fall apart. Families being the base unit of culture will bring the culture crashing down. If you have not read that encyclical of Paul VI, go back and read it. 
Humani Vitae, it's actually not very long at all, it means on human life. And everything we now stand at, he wrote that in 1968, and here we are, the 40, a little bit beyond the 44th anniversary of it, published on July 25th, 1968. And everything he said in that has come true. How can all religions be right when they contradict each other? They can't. It's impossible. So then it must come down to this question. And it's the question that the diabolical never wants asked because he never wants the question thought about. If all religions are not equal, then which one is right? Every single person has the moral obligation before Almighty God to answer that question for themselves. And we do not get to fall back on, well, this is my family's tradition, this is what we've always done, this seems to make sense to me, this is all my mother-in-law would have a fit. <laughs> we must stand before Almighty God and reveal our conscience to him. And we must give an account for how much we sought the truth in this life. Know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Ignore the truth, and you become enslaved, and your civilization deteriorates and finally collapses. Archbishop Fulton Sheen again. The root of world betterment is in the soil of the human soul. Its branches and its fruits are in the society and the state. The world can be remade only by the remaking of man himself. Politics does not become more just by an election it becomes more just only through your politicians. And how do politicians get into office? For at least one more election, we vote them in. But what are we basing our votes on? Are we basing our votes on what's going to happen to my tax base? Are we basing our votes on, this is the best way I can advance my 401k retirement plan? Are we basing our votes on what's happening to the property tax? Or are you basing your votes on truth, however much it might cost you? Human beings are born with an instinct for the truth. That's how five or six year olds eventually figure out on their own that there is no fat man who flies around the world on Christmas Eve. It doesn't make sense to them because we have an instinctual nature for the truth. That's why three year olds walk up to mommy and say, why is the sky blue? That's why they walk up to daddy and say, where did I come from? And they have done that since the dawn of man, because we have in us the desire for the truth. We are made to the image and likeness of God, and God is truth. And if we somehow shut that off in us, because it becomes inconvenient, because I know somewhere back here that what I'm hearing over there is true, but I also know in that same place back here that because that's true, everything about me has to change. I therefore pull the blinds down on the truth. Do not delude yourselves 
Anybody who has pulled the blind down on truth will never behold truth in the face. Never. We are destined to be with the truth. What was the context of our blessed Lord's conversation with Pilate? Are you a king? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, my followers would be here fighting to free me. As it is, my kingdom is not of this world. So there we have it. Which kingdom do you belong to? When the Roman Empire was falling apart in the beginning of the 5th century, had some barbarian incursions in the sort of the middle of the 4th here and there. They were beginning to get over the walls and pierce the Roman legions' defenses, etc. But it really started to come tumbling down very late. 300s, beginning 400. Contemporaneous with one of the most brilliant men that has ever lived, in addition to one of the holiest, St. Augustine of Hippo in North Africa. He was the bishop, convert from a very horribly sexually immoral life. He'd gone through and studied every single uh, uh, philosophical slash religious thing he could get his hands on. And finally, not through his own intelligence, but through the prayers of his mother, St. Monica, he converted to the faith. In the process of this conversion, because he gave himself totally to God, totally to the truth, he was able to now begin to see things in a different way. When the empire began falling apart, put yourself in the shoes of a 20-year-old Roman in the year 400. 20, 25 year old Romans hanging around together at the local Roman bar, smashing their pottery mugs together, toasting each other. We're the masters of the universe. We've inherited a thousand years of the patrimony of the empire. We are the masters of the universe. And they look out their door and there's Attila the Hun marching down via Appia. Stripping the gold off the temples, Raping, pillaging, burning, tearing down the temples, taking whatever they want, looting the Roman treasury, and then coming back for more constantly. Laying waste to an empire that had lasted a thousand years. If you're 20 or 25 in those shoes, what's going on in your head? How dare you take from me the spoils. This is my inheritance. This is what I deserve. My fathers gave this to their fathers who gave it to their fathers and their fathers who handed it on to me. But you know what? The barbarians couldn't give a rip. So those young people started panicking. Now because Catholicism had become the state religion, under the Emperor Theodosius in uh, 380, 385, most of the citizenry of Rome uh, was Catholic. And because they saw the empire to which they had attached in their minds their religion, they saw the civilization falling apart. And it was falling apart, fast. And they had married in their minds church and state Act. In reality, they were married together. So when the empire started falling apart, their natural sort of gut instinct was that everything's falling apart, including the church, which means it must be the end of the world. And that was the mentality that seized hold at the dawn of the 5th century, which inspired St. Augustine to write probably his seminal work, The City of God. And he wrote The City of God precisely to quell the fears of an entire population, an entire civilization, watching its entire patrimony pass away after a thousand years. And it was gone in a generation. Gone. And he said in The City of God, we, the church, does not belong to the city of man. 
Empires come and empires go. Civilizations rise and civilizations fall. We do not belong to the city of man. We belong to the city of God. If you have not read the city of God, if you know nothing about it, add that to your reading list behind Humanae Vitae. It is amazing, 1,600 years later, it's amazing how everything stays the same. 1,600 years later. To go back to Archbishop Sheen. The only way, speaking of government officials here, the only way to build up socialism is to deny the soul and its relationship to God by the persecution of religion. But how have we gotten to this point? There's not just 500 or 600 people sitting in Washington, D.C., you know, deciding all of this. They've gotten there because Americans voted them there. Now, sure, you say, well, we didn't know they were going to do all of this. Really? We've given you a republic, madam, if you can hold on to it. But you can't because you're too busy worrying about your 401ks and who you can copulate with. That's what, you can, what you're concerned about. You have denied that there is an objective morality rooted in truth. You have denied the source and the authority of where that truth comes from, so you get what you asked for. Chief Justice Roberts, feel free to boo. <laughs> made a very, very salient point. He said, it is not the job of this court to protect the people from the consequences of their political choices. Spot on. Spot on, Chief Justice, spot on. It is not the job of this court to protect the people from the uh, consequences of their political choices. And he's right. See, this is what the American experiment is. Here, here's freedom. Here's freedom. Do the right thing. 250 years later, we've done the wrong thing. The majority of Americans have done the wrong thing. The scales have tipped. And they've tipped because people will not figure out which is the true religion, which espouses divine truth and says, from this truth issues the morality and orders the way you live. That's it. That's it. And because this lack of love for the truth, and that's what it is, it's a lack of love for the truth. Because that is missing. If you don't love the truth, the only thing left to love is yourself. And the person who loves himself, the person who loves himself, dies in that self-love. And so does the civilization with him. This self-love has so grasped this nation because it had freedom to be able to do it. It was given the freedom, but freedom misused is freedom abused and eventually freedom lost great professor at the University of Notre Dame Law School, Charles Rice, has said on a number of times, I'm free to put gas into my car. I'm also free to put sugar water in it, mm -hmm. right? I'm free. I can do whatever I want. I'm free. Freedom, yeah. But the minute I misuse that freedom and I direct it to something that is not good, my freedom becomes an enslavement. I'm free to put sugar water in the gas tank of my car, but then my car will no longer run. It 
is not the job of this court to protect the people from the consequences of their political choices. Mm. Nor is it the job of the divine to protect people from the consequences of their moral choices. How can we pray, God, save America, when we will not, as a nation, pursue the truth? Because the pursuit of the truth means that everything that I'm about, I want to be divorced and remarried. I don't care about fathering extra children. If she gets pregnant, we can fix it. What are we praying for? Are we praying for God to uphold that civilization? How can he uphold that civilization when it is diametrically opposed to him? The truth is not a concept. It's expressed conceptually, but the truth is a person. It is Jesus Christ. And you cannot look the truth in the, faith, in the face and lie to yourself and pretend I'm being patriotic. You're not being patriotic. I'm not being patriotic. God bless America? How about America bless God? <laughs> I'd like to read to you a larger uh, analysis of the situation. This was written in 1969 uh, and 1970. And I need to read this. I need to stop for one moment here for a tape change. I'm not going to tell you right now who wrote this, but uh, I'll tell you when it's done. But I want you to listen to the wisdom, because when you hear who wrote it, you'll be, hmm, how did he know all that back then? Now, this person was writing in reference to the church, specifically the Catholic Church, in 1969. Let me set the context for you. 1969, eight months after John, uh, Pope Paul VI issues his encyclical, Humanae Vitae, not making up on the spot that the church doesn't like artificial contraception, but restating the 2,000-year-old tradition rooted in the truth of Christ and the church that this is evil. And if you pursue evil, the consequences will follow. So that's the context. Great uproar in the Catholic Church this time. He said... The church will become small and will have to start afresh, more or less, from the beginning. She will no longer be able to inhabit many of the edifices she built in prosperity. As the number of her adherents diminish, she will lose many of her social privileges. As a small society, the church will make much bigger demands on the initiative of her individual members went on to say, it will be hard, it will be hard going for the church, for the process of crystallization and clarification will cost her much valuable energy. It will make her poor and cause her to become the church of the meek. The process will be long and wearisome, as was the road from the false progressivism on the eve of the French Revolution. But when the trial of this sifting is passed, a great power will flow from a more spiritualized and simplified church. Men in a totally planned world will find themselves unspeakably lonely. If they have completely lost sight of God, they will feel the whole horror of their poverty. They will discover the little flock of believers as something wholly new. They will discover it as a hope that is meant for them, an answer for which they have always been searching in secret. And so it seems certain to me that the church is facing very hard times. The real crisis has scarcely begun. We will have to count on terrific upheavals, but I'm equally certain about what will remain at the end, not the church of the political cult, which is dead already with globalization, but the church of faith, 
She may well no longer be the dominant social power to the extent that she was until recently, but she will enjoy a fresh blossoming and be seen as man's home where he will find life and hope beyond death. Written by a man named Joseph Ratzinger, uh, currently Pope Benedict. He wrote that in 1969. In 2010, 41 years later, now successor of St. Peter, he stood at Mass on the fourth Sunday of Advent and delivered a homily in which he said, just as in the days of the Roman Empire, as the sun was setting over an entire globe, we now see the same thing developing here. The civilization we know is over. These are the death throes of it. This is the death rattle. It's a horrible thing to hear. I remember being 14 years old, watching the bicentennial. We were living in San Francisco. All of you remember this, the huge ships, the great ships coming in here to New York Harbor. These great, powerful boats. The celebration. Everything. It's got goosebumps right now thinking about it. I remember the terrific speeches and the patriotism and those, those fantastic jet planes flying over everywhere with their red, white, and blue, you know, vapors coming out of the back. We saw it again with Ronald Reagan, what, six, seven years later, eight years later, with the, uh, you know, the fireworks here and the Statue of Liberty and the whole bit. So good to be an American. So awesome. And the seeds of our own destruction were already growing. They had already begun germinating. When I sat there watching the great ships come in to New York Harbor when I was 14, I had no idea, didn't register with me, didn't know, that simply three years later, the Supreme Court had signed the death warrant for what today would be 60 million fellow Americans. Because morality, not rooted in truth, is impossible. And Pilate looked at him and said, what is truth? God bless you.